All right, it's time for another episode of The Wrestling Perspective. Lars, what are you doing over there? I'm just having a little fun, Dennis. You're wearing right. a Ranther t-shirt, so I thought I'd bring up my guy. That, you know you I mean? know, hey, listen. Now there's two, there's two of me on the screen. See, that's me on your chest. How, how does it feel to have me between your boobs? Yeah, actually, it's only the second time you've been there. I mean, <laughs> and I appreciate both times. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. I, but, you know, went out. I had to buy the shirt. I love the old baseball sleeve shirts. See, that's the thing. When you come as my guest. You, all you have to do is just to ask. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, we have a huge show. Billy Corgan. Yes. I'm uh, super psyched. No longer am I the second best musician on this podcast. <laughs> no longer. That's no more. fucked up. I know. <laughs> I don't That's even play an up. instrument. Let's get to as many emails as we can. Sure. When uh, Smashing Pumpkin shows up, we'll bring him on and talk uh, some wrestling. But uh, Billy Corgan, super excited. NWA. Well, you know what? Yeah, I'm super excited. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Dan. They're promoting their uh, October 28th pay-per-view, Cleveland, Ohio. Make sure you go out and get it because we're definitely watching. Oh, I'm getting it for sure. I am wonder if I can finagle free tickets for him since Cleveland's only like a three-hour drive. I'm pretty sure Billy Corgan, since he's going to be on the show, might help you. But let's get to some emails and you can write right. later. Pudge from Fowlerville asks, Hey guys, big fan of the show. What was your favorite wrestling toy or memorabilia that you own? And we, we've gotten a memorabilia one, but is there a wrestling toy? Well, so it's so funny because as I'm sitting here, I'm looking at some of my favorites. This is one of my prized possessions. This is a Masawa oh. signed. I, I believe this is the 11 inch figure, but this is one of my prized possessions here. And I would say I got it as a gift in Japan. And Masao was still alive at the time um, that the gift was given. And it's funny because last night, and I know we're dating ourselves a little bit as Gold Dust took a tumble. Um, I met Kobashi. And in also Ultimo Dragon was there at the show I was at last night, West Coast Pro. We obviously have had Vinny Masaro here and, and uh, Levi Shapiro wrestling mm -hmm. and Chris Hero. And I'm a Chris Hero's in-ring return, and I will break the news tonight, will be at West Coast Pro on November 17th. So we're actually going to see a return of, of a guy that I've sorely missed watching wrestle. Um, but, yeah, that's probably one of my pop prize positions. As a kid, I didn't really have toys. So as an adult, that's when I did most of my toy collecting. I, I don't have them anymore, but it was the old plastic or the old rubber WCW figures. Got it. I I had them all as much as I love the Hasbro the ones. San Francisco toy maker ones, right? Yes. 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 The official San Francisco toy maker. Yeah, yeah. As much as I love the WWF Hasbro figures, which yeah. I mean, to me, no matter how I got, I got some right here. Those are the Hasbros. Uh, I love them. So it, and Sting down there, Slaughter. One of them took it up. There's Taker, Heart, Punk, uh, Warrior. You know. It, it, as much as I liked when they been, were able to move and be bendy, there's nothing more classic than those figures. I agree. I mean, even these LJNs, this is a custom LJN. with a, It's a Piper with an old firm casuals t-shirt on. Oh. But, uh, you know, and I also got, you know, this Terry Funk here. Very minty Terry Funk. That's cute. And then I, it's cute. I, and then Terry Funk is not cute. He's a man. And so he is handsome. And then I got my Bam Bam Bigelow LJ. And this is also another custom. Okay. Uh, so I like I like the custom toys because obviously they're one of a kind kind of things, you know. And uh, but the LJNs, I think, were, were a lot like those San Francisco original San Francisco toy makers, the ones that you're talking about. All right. This one comes from Jackson out of Philly. A uh, boy's great show. In your opinion, what wrestler had the best non-wrestling TV, music, or movie project outside of the wrestling industry? Why don't you go first on that? You know what? The safe answer would be Piper and They Live, right? I don't think anything tops that. That was... I don't... Yeah, I don't you know, I was going to actually... That's where I was going to. I don't think there's a better... I don't, there, there are yeah. things I could say to be, you know, funny or clever. Like, well, the Macho Man rap album was not horrible. Did you ever well, hear that? Oh, I own it. Yeah. Not yeah. horrible. Not great. Not horrible. Be a man, Hogan. Probably a, it was a great song, actually. Well, you know, 
Hulk Hogan also had a rap record. Oh, I I didn't hear that one. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think I have that one too. I I have that on CD, but that should make a an, a vinyl appearance. But I would say there's two that come to mind. First of all, Piper. Mm -hmm. But if you think about, are we just talking about? Because I mean, this gets a little tricky. Because then you got, you know, Michael P. S. Hayes with Bad Street USA, which was also a record, right? You know, but it was also his theme. But like that was like that was kind of cutting edge because that he made this record that became his theme. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's what was, you know, that I ready to rumble. Uh, whether you like the movie or not, you know, it's wrestling theme, but it's outside the wrestling industry. So could you put that in the list or do you have to take it out because it is a wrestling movie with wrestlers? Well, that's the thing. I, but you would, I would say definitely you're 100% correct when you say Roddy Piper in They Live because that movie is also a very iconic film now. And it's treasured in the in a, in a way that I don't think uh, all the other aforementioned things that we've talked about are are treasured by movie people by uh, everybody. You know, it's not wrestling people. It's I think it's like one of those horror movies that I mean they make you know action figures out of him now in that character. So it's like how do you? That's it's pretty iconic. I, you know, I'm not sure I could put anything The Rock has done on there yet. I no, mean, no. nothing Cena's done. I mean, Cena's played some great uh, roles in movies, but nothing I would say, you know, that I would put up there as. No. Yeah. No. Because I, mean, I you, you, yeah. Cena, by the way, the better actor out of everybody. Well, I'd say no, Batista no. than Cena. Nah, Piper. Well, I mean, but then Batista. Well, I mean, well, not outside of Piper. I'm just talking out of Cena, Rock, Batista, yeah, those yeah, guys yeah. now. I think Cena's a better actor than he was a wrestler. I think I think Batista is a better actor than he was a wrestler. You know, a couple Batista movies you could put up there. Did you uh Stuber was funny, not a great movie, but funny. I just um, love his deadpan and I love him in could you put Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy on that list? Well, I think you could. I think that's those movies all are incredible. Yes. I think they're incredible from start to finish. So you know what? Movies. We'll put we'll put uh, Piper out of respect. One B, Batista. Just about anything he's been in, because yes. I don't think Batista's been in anything bad yet. No, yeah, I think you're right. All right, uh, let's try to sneak one more question in before uh, Billy Corgan shows up. This comes from Sam from Beantown. Jim Cornette, Vince Russo, Eric Bischoff, Bischoff are all super bitter about the wrestling industry today. Mm -hmm. But with the way Tony Khan tweets, could you see him turning into that kind of person down the line? Those guys have one thing in common. They've all ran wrestling companies and have been bookers. Vince Russo lasted, what, three years? four years. So you can't really, I would be better too. Cause he hasn't really done anything since I don't know him, but, uh, Eric Bischoff, I, I, you know, he's bitter. I, you know, Jim Cornette to me, isn't bitter though. See, that's the okay. thing. I think he's see, I think Bischoff and Vince Russo have a, have a different perspective on wrestling. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think Jim Cornette still loves it and that's why he's passionate and opinionated, you know? So I think there's a big difference between Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff and Jim Cornette. I wouldn't put Jim Cornette in the same uh, category. I think Jim Cornette, he also talks about, you know, current things. And I think he gives his opinion. I think where kudos and flowers are, appropriate i think he gives them i think where uh constructive criticism or something that he doesn't like uh i think it's appropriate there too so i'm a big fan of jim Cornette and his podcast and everything i i, I value his opinions because i think a lot of them are on point you know i i go back and i look at vince russo right because he's kind of one of those guys that did change the industry uh maybe if if you're a sports fan the Terrell Davis of of um, of wrestling, where Terrell Davis was probably the best running back for what four or five years, and injuries derailed him. Mm. Was he a Hall of Famer or not? I say no, but some people can say yes. 
just because of the length. Vince Russo changed the game. Then he goes to WCW, WCW and Flounders for, what, three or four years there. I, I don't know. And then how on to impact too. I mean, yeah. he was at impact too. Yeah. I so, think, but see that. Yeah, go ahead. I don't, I don't know how to view his career. Well, here's the thing. I think there's some really great stuff that Vince Russo did to the wrestling business, but I also think that there was a lot of great stuff that he did that ruined the wrestling business, you know? And I just think his approach at it, you know, I remember first time I ever saw Eric Bischoff, he was an announcer for the AWA. Yes. You know, so Jim Cornette was, you know, if anybody knows the business and works the business, I mean, you can you can say, you know, he's the guy had the longest career, I would say. Maybe him and Bischoff came in around the same time. But, you know, Jim Cornette, I, I don't I think maybe Jim Cornette honestly has the longest tenure in the business. I mean, he was a photographer first and then made into a manager or whatever. So. I don't know. I think it's let me ask you this side question before we transition out into our guest for episode 390. Uh, really quick before we take a break. Uh, who had the bigger impact on the wrestling bu- bu- business? Is it like Vince Russo or Eric Bischoff in your opinion? Russo. I kind of I kind of I go back and forth once again. I was a WCW but is, he, but is he given but see that Vince Russo was also at a place where Jim Cornette was working at the same time. Right. And right. it was Vince McMahon, Jim Cornette, and Vince Russo. So all right. When we come back, we will uh talk to probably the bucket list guests that we've been waiting on. We've had champions and hall of famers, but uh, oh, it seems like every week we always bring up Billy. And we're excited to finally get them on. So uh, we'll be back. Watch the commercials. Do whatever you guys do. And uh, when we come back, episode 390, we'll be right back. All right, we're back. Wrestling Perspective, episode 390. Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Farrell. Billy Corgan, Smashing Pumpkins, NWA owner, join us here on the podcast, which first and foremost, I think we had the moment off the air, but uh, bucket list, we're kind of giddy like little schoolgirls right now. So thank you so much for joining us to talk some wrestling tonight with us. Yeah, I'm happy. You know, uh, it's amazing because, you know, obviously, you know, your your co-host here is in, in the rare position of, of walking the lines between the two worlds most people really don't understand what that feels like they think they do but they really don't because most people in music really uh don't understand uh anybody from music wanting to give love to professional wrestling much less work in the business um so it's not many people who really do understand that that it really comes from a place of love to want to take what you have earned in music and bring it over to wrestling and what's even weirder is when I first started doing it 10, 11 years ago, people in wrestling view it with suspicion, <laughs> which is even weirder because yeah. as I used to say to Dixie Carter back when I worked for TNA, you know, we get into these kind of absurdities about fame and, and stuff like that. But I said, you know, oftentimes I was the most famous person in the building and I'm arguing with somebody who's big in wrestling world, but to the outside world, I mean, right. there's a lot of personalities in wrestling that, couldn't get arrested and i don't mean that disrespectfully it's just wrestling gets very focused on what is important for wrestling but sometimes loses the plot which you got to kind of sell to the rest of the world who's very skeptical of what wrestling even is now this isn't my opening question but this is kind of a selfish question where you do a lot of interviews and you do a lot of different type of interviews with a different type of media when you come on this podcast and listen self-admittedly after we hit stop a lot of people are like this was awesome totally different i had fun but when you get the note going oh wow i'm about to get on with Lars fredrickson of ranted does it kind of change your mindset of wow i'm about to sit down with a guy who's done what i've done in both music and you know he's done some wrestling stuff too do, do you come into this a little more relaxed like all right finally someone i can kind of talk to on the same wavelength it does help it does help because uh, quite frankly and obviously i intersect with a ton of people in wrestling most people in wrestling don't care about my musical life at all because they're very focused on what goes on in wrestling so I don't take it personally. Like it's it's okay if somebody's not a fan. It's not going to change the way I book them. It's not going to change the way right. I, I develop them as a talent. But you would think, and I'm saying this now, I'm saying this selfishly, okay? 
because maybe this is my personality. If I was working for someone who was a famous person in another field, whether they were an NFL star or in my case, a rock star, I would at least do a little bit of research. So if I intersected with my boss, I would have some relatability there or at least some understanding of their journey so that there might be a moment where that becomes advantageous to me because the boss might go, oh, this person actually understands what I do outside of this room. And maybe that gives them a, a chance for a push or something. I'm talking about completely Machiavellian selfishness here. Sure. Most of the wrestlers I come across, if they are not fans already, and a lot of wrestlers I work for, for, for with for years, and I'll find out later they're, they're huge fans. I had no idea. They would act like they weren't. And eventually they'd feel comfortable enough to tell me, but I worked a lot of wrestlers. They have no idea what I do. <laughs> never listen to a song. They couldn't tell you whether I won a Grammy or I played local clubs my whole life. They have zero interest. And that's again, totally cool. But it's weird to me that you wouldn't kind of want to know who you're working for because, because if it doesn't translate in wrestling, it doesn't translate. Now that I own the national wrestling Alliance now for five, six years, now I have an established credibility in wrestling because I worked in wrestling for years. That matters to them far more than my status as a musician in the outside world. Well, let me ask you this. So, you know, as musicians being in our world, right, there's a, there's a level of, of, of guard, a guardedness, if that's even a fucking word, that we have to carry with us because obviously there's a lot of, you know, craziness like we were kind of talking on uh, before we got on here. Now, do you find that yourself, do you find yourself like even actually more guarded um, in your world? Because now you deal with wrestling and rock and roll. And uh, do you find yourself like a little bit more closed off? I've gotten used to over 30 years of interviewing, uh, basically always about myself slash the band. So I kind of feel like what is worth sharing, not worth sharing. I have a really good sense of that. Wrestling doesn't work like that at all. Honestly, and I feel comfortable telling you this, and you know, if somebody wants to pick it up in the dirt sheet world, feel free. Uh, I'm happy to get you some clicks. My point being, I really probably shouldn't interview in wrestling at all. At all. Because, similar dynamic, the wrestling media has very little understanding of my place in rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that wrestling media tries to whip up for clicks is not only not helpful to me, it, it, it puts me in a position where I have to really choose between wrestling and rock and roll. And I don't want to make that choice. I'm already making that choice. I'm already investing a lot of my time and, and money to promote the National Wrestling Alliance. The, the, only, the only reason, the only reason that I allow myself to be interviewed about wrestling is because I want to promote the National Wrestling Alliance. It doesn't do me any good. Now you could say it's, it does me good if the National Wrestling Alliance does well. But me having people come after me and say weird stuff and make up stories and try to take quotes out of context. And wrestling media is not like normal media. They will drop words out of your quotes. They will they will change what you said. I mean, it is, it is nowhere near the normal rules of rock and roll, where at least they'll but, quote you. But can you even call it a fucking wrestling media? That's that's the thing. Well, I, that, that, I'm, that, I'm being kind. It's a it's a clickbait business, and I yeah. I mean, I think you are being kind because I feel like the the people who are doing a lot of the writing about wrestling, um, they, they they they're first of all they're not responsible. Secondly, they're not fact checkers. You know what I mean? Third, they they it's all about hearsay, and it's so one sided now where you can obviously tell who's in bed with who. Does that make sense? And I understand that that's kind of what media is now in today's world. It's not 1960s Walter Cronkite where it's, you know, you know, spoken down the middle or with just the facts, sir. Or, but, or, you know, pretends, or pretends to speak down the middle. But yes, I understand your point. But, you know, but it's so it, it, for me, like to even, you know, say that I'm a wrestling journalist, like I just I love the, 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 the human interest story. Right. And that's why I love professional wrestling, because if you can because I like emotion. Right. And I like feeling emotionally connected to somebody. Right. But I guess where I'm trying to get with you is was the NWA something that you're like, OK, this is the next phase of my life. 
like I, I'm a musician, I, you know, and I get it. Right. But there's as musicians, we mature and there's certain other interests and things that we want to accomplish. Yeah. Did you did you see the NWA as something? OK, this is the next phase of my life. I love that question. And, and, and crazy enough, I was literally thinking about this today because it's been now a 10, 11 year journey with me in professional wrestling. It started really honestly over 20 years ago when I did some stuff with ECW and they had me get in a ring and stuff like that. But that was more like celebrity, do some stuff. But I explored quite a, a, you know, Paul Heyman offered me a a piece of ECW, which is kind of an infamous story. So I almost bought my way into ECW. There was an opportunity there. But after, even after ECW folded, I looked at starting a wrestling company with some of the other people from ECW. So it's been a kind of a 20 year journey. I started hanging out at the fairgrounds in Nashville with, with Jarrett and TNA in 2002. I was going down there when punk was 19 years old. I mean, my history is kind of interesting, but to actually be working in the business now for about 10 or 11 years. So I was actually thinking about that this morning. And what's weird to me about it is, and I, I'm, I am getting your question. I, I swear. <laughs> what's weird to me about it was initially it was kind of like, Oh, this is kind of different and fun. But the real answer to your question is somewhere along the way in that 11 years, I was like, I like that who I am in the world really doesn't translate into this other world that I'm fascinated by. And I'm going to have to work hard and I'm going to have to prove myself in a totally different way than has anything to do with my musical life. Yes, there's things that I bring over having made a bunch of videos and I can deal with budgets and all that stuff and but at the end of the day, I threw myself in the deep end of the pool. So the, to the spirit of your question, it was it was somewhere along age 45 or 55, 50s. I, I decided for some reason I need this completely other challenge <laughs> that will that will that will beguile me, drive me insane, make me question my sanity, <laughs> make me spend millions of dollars on my own money. Be be in many ways until recently, honestly, really undervalued and underappreciated for what I was trying to bring to the business overall. And then like, you know, a little bit, go back to the wrestling media, have to navigate, uh, you know, with a bunch of sort of weird dynamics, which don't make any sense in the normal world, don't make any sense with business world. You can see why some of the top tier people like the McMahons don't have anything to do with that media. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they do in their own way, but by and large, you don't see Vince going out there doing podcasts right, right. because there's really no there there. It's very pernicious and inward facing. So to somebody who's actually done stuff in the world and, and, and sees how amazing wrestling can be, right? you know, watch almost people kind of keep dragging it down into the carny because, because I don't know, they're, they're, they're facing off on Reddit over like, the color of somebody's shoes. I mean, it's just like, it's mind blowing to me, mm. but here we are. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a wild journey. Um, I feel really good about where the NWA is at, particularly with the wrestling. Um, you know, as I said, I'm busted open the other day, we just signed two TV deals. Um, I can't announce the details yet, but at least it's like great to be able to say that we're doing something right. for 2024. Um, but yeah, a, a, not a day goes by literally hand in my heart that I do not question my sanity to work in this business. It is a, it is a punishing crazy (laughs) business when it's, I like, I like to say when wrestling is great, it's really great. Mm. And when it's bad, it's the shits. Right. It's really almost, there's no in between because you can go to an indie show and see a great match. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a sold out arena. Mm. Fans are popping. We had a six man the other night with ECD, EC3's new promotion, Exodus pro. It's a six man EC3 and two of his local Cleveland guys, the guy who trained him and another guy versus the Southern six through Billy Silas Mason, Kerry Morton and Alex Taylor, all from the NWA. About a crowd of 200 in a little ballroom crowd was rocking. It was as good as I've been to WrestleMania. I, we, I had a great time. It isn't about size with professional wrestling. When you see a great match and you're investing, you're having a great time. It's the greatest thing in the world. And then you can be at the, on the biggest stages of the world and see matches that fans don't care about. And you can almost tell the talent's not happy with the finish. And you're like, oh, my God, what am I watching? It's like ultimate car crash in slow mo. Mm. You know, uh, 
kind of speaking on this whole your journey into the NWA, I have to at least ask when we all get into something new, we have this romanticized version of how it's going to be versus the reality of that situation. And now that you're several years and now getting TV deals and NWA is taken off, what is the reality versus your romanticized version of what this journey was going to be like? I'm very attracted to the creative aspect of wrestling, the characters, the stories, the journey, even behind the scenes of that a wrestler takes from an unknown to like today. Uh, we didn't take a picture, so it's nothing that would be on social media. I was in my cafe. There's a local rabbi in Chicago where up here where I live who runs wrestling shows. And he was in my cafe today. I see him regularly. And so I said, hi. And then I realized he was with somebody and he introduced me was Billy Starks, who just signed with AEW. I think she's 18 years old, out of Louisville. Very nice person. Obviously, huge, bright future. That part is awesome, right? It's like, and I'm just as excited for her, even though she's not in the NWA, right? It's like, I'm excited. She told me she's wrestled nine times this week. She's obviously on a journey that is very exciting for a young person, just like how, you know, Lars and I were once young, young musicians playing the club and the guy from the record company was in the back. She's making that journey. She signed the big deal now. She's going to be on national te television with regularity. And she's with, you know, the hottest company over the last three years, which is AW. It's like, what a cool thing. Like, I love that part of it. If I could just stay in the that part of it, the people, the cool part, I would love it. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the grind of selling tickets. It's the grind of, People who, you know, they're stuck on NWA 1984. You know what I mean? Right. It's the grind of, of people who are like, they, they're like cult members. They, 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 it would be like, I only like Led Zeppelin, but I can't like the Beatles, right? It's like, I, that stuff I don't understand. If you're a wrestling fan, why? And I got a bunch of heat for when I said, if you don't like Tyrus and I said, if you don't like Tyrus in wrestling, you don't like professional wrestling. What I was saying is there's room for everybody. Like there's all these companies like, if you don't like a six, seven guy in wrestling, like, I don't know. That's, I, I grew up on Andre the Giant and Big Show. And it's like, why wouldn't you want the big guy? You know, you, you got these forces that want to bring in outside stuff saying people shouldn't wrestle because they do other jobs. And it's all so stuff so, so beyond me, right? So it's all that stuff. I just think, ah, oh, I just don't want anything to do with that because the, the, part, the part that matters is what goes on in front of the fans. The table, well, the, the, all that stuff is magical. Well, it's curious that you brought up, you know, Titus, because because I feel like, you know, a lot of people that was kind of a negative negative reaction to him uh, becoming the champion. What was the thinking besides just being a big guy on your behalf to make him the champion? Like what 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 was the what were you trying to accomplish something? Did you accomplish it? Yes. Um, the roots of that journey and this goes back to what i like about the the gig when i was in tna and working in the office and and on the booking committee committee they would give me the personalities in tna that they didn't want to deal with so i was in charge of the difficult personality <laughs> part and i'm not even joking that's fucked up so Ty tyrus i was on that list so was nick aldis mm. okay my relationships with both future NWA world heavyweight champions was born of working with them in TNA because they were on the difficult talent list. And in both cases, I was able to form some relationship to try to understand me being my own difficult sort of musician type. Okay. What is it about this, these personalities that are rubbing the office the wrong way? Why do they feel underutilized? Can I be a translator for them? with the office. So to varying degrees of success, I was able to accomplish that uh, at TNA. So my relationship with George Murdoch, the human being, um, didn't end the minute he started working for a major uh, media outlet and, 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 and I was out of TNA. We stayed in contact. He w basically had dropped completely out of professional wrestling. So when he wanted to come back to professional wrestling, he reached out to me, the mm. person that he knew, you know, and said, what do you think? And so it was something that we had, uh, so it was something that we had discussed. Now, going back to TNA, and I'll be quick about it, because every time I open my mouth about Tyrus, somebody gets mad. 
(laughs) (laughs) I told George Murdoch, the human being, eight years ago, sitting backstage at Universal Studios where TNA shot and now AW shoots, they're not using you right. And he said, okay, you tell me how you would use me as a talent. What Tyrus ended up doing in the NWA was what we talked about eight years ago. Mm. So when I'm in a position of power, which I'm, you know, I run NWA, right? Uh, okay, well, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Right. And if people think I'm the type of person that's going to shy away from the other arguments against Tyrus as a talent or as a human being, they, they don't know me. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm somebody who's like cashed a lot of checks with his mouth, including stuff that cost me a lot of money. So I'm not shy about that type of thing. So did we accomplish together what we set out to do for Tyrus, the character and George Murdoch, the human being? Absolutely. Cool. The fact that it was controversial. Okay. Okay. Wrestling. What did uh, Eric Bischoff say? Controversy creates cash. If you're going to let that mob book your promotion, you shouldn't run a wrestling promotion. Now, uh, talking about the NWA, you have the October 28th pay-per-view coming up in Cleveland. You have November 4th tapings coming up in Nashville, Sky, Skyway, which I've been there for uh, Impact tapings, which I absolutely love that place, in November 18th. You have this new television uh, contract or two of them coming up. Does that change the way now you're going to start booking these shows opposed to before this uh, television deal has come into place? Everything we've done over the last four years is to prepare for this moment. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a it's a yes question in that we're going to change it a little bit, and it's a no in that we've been preparing. Um, I it's hard to say, but it's a little bit like a, a band who doesn't want to play all their songs before the album comes out. <laughs> we've kind of held some stuff back, which obviously maybe hurts us in the short term. But we want to sure. we want to hit those gas pedals when we're when we're hopefully reaching out to a, a general and, and or mainstream crowd. Um, you know, relying on YouTube, which has been its own, you know, hall of mirrors as a, as a partner for content is one thing. Uh, relying on, you know, a crowd who's, who's very, very focused on wrestling in a particular way in a particular period of time to understand how I'm trying to rebuild the NWA, not only historically, but into a content provider that will last and run at the highest levels, not just be kind of cool today is very difficult for that crowd to understand. So hopefully now moving into this other level of media, um, we'll start to gain that sort of wider audience that traditionally watched wrestling for 70 years and overall, not completely has stopped watching wrestling. And I don't mean just people who, don't watch wrestling and used to, I'm talking about young people who have zero interest in wrestling because it does sort of doesn't work in the way that they consume media. Um, I'd like to bring some of that crowd back because that's what was always wrestling sweet spot was reaching out to sort of a very cross section of America. And obviously that applies internationally. Just people just want to kick back and, and, and understand what they're watching. And it's, it's as Pat Kenny uh, formerly Simon Diamond of uh, WWE and uh, ECW f- fame likes to say, it's not rocket science. It's like wrestling when it's done really well is something that everybody can understand, whether you're six years old or you're 66. So we're, we're trying to bring some of that back. I always pay attention when companies bring in talent. And what one thing that were really caught my attention because I've been watching NWA for the last couple of years pretty consistently. And I noticed that the product had changed at one point. It's after you brought in guys like Homicide and Ricky Morton. And I started to see different aspects where this, more of the story was being told, more of the psychology was there. There was less. I was just at an indie show last night and West Coast uh, Pro. And the main event, albeit two great professional wrestlers, Starboy, Starboy Charlie, and uh, Titus Alexander, um, they went on way too fucking long. They went on 20 minutes way too fucking long. They did five pile drivers and still no finish. 
And that shit drives me fucking crazy. I hate that. And I understand that there's places for that. So what do you do to curtail, you know, like, and I I think AEW is a great example of letting shit get way out of hand because it's for me, and I'll say this out loud. I love that company. I'm so burnt out by it because it's literally the same fucking match over and over and over again. And that's what I get bombarded with for two hours. How do you, when you're walking in, putting a show together, bring you know, there's something for everybody. Cause that's the one thing I do notice about the NWA and, and your programming, there is something for everybody. If you want a high spot match, you got that too, but it's not two hours of that shit. So. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a historian. I wouldn't claim to be a historian, but I, I, I watched wrestling in the, I started watching wrestling probably about 1971. Hmm. So I had no idea I was watching some of the greatest legends in the history of the business, whether it was Vern Gagne or Dick the Bruiser or Nick Bockwinkel, Bobby Heenan. So imagine I'm four or five years old. I'm watching people who created the blueprint of what is modern professional wrestling on television. Because if you watch like Heenan stuff from like the mid 60s, he's not the guy who becomes in 71 and 75 or whatever. Those guys kind of figured it out in the late sixties, early seventies. So, I, I, so that's my, like, I, I, I've talked many times about the first time I heard black Sabbath, it changed my life. I heard it. I heard black Sabbath when I was eight and I've been chasing that sound ever since. So similar, I saw wrestling in a particular way. Okay. So fine. I have that memory, but kids memories have, you know, have a way of sort of romanticizing stuff like Disney sure. or something. Okay. But now I've got Austin idol. I've got homicide. I've got jazz. I've got Pat Kenny. I've got Dr. Tom Pritchard. These are all people who work behind the scenes. Uh, we had recently a Medusa. So, and Ricky Morton obviously is in the company. You go to those people and you say, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell you. And you, and you start to learn the difference between like, let's call it the romanticized version of the 84 finish versus no wait that finish works in 84 74 64 and will work in 2024 because it has to do with money they worked a certain way to draw money mm-hmm. it's not trendy it's a way to draw money when and i don't want to say the names because it's sort of maybe not fair because i of course people tell me stuff when some of the greatest legends in the history of the business call talents on the roster, totally at not asked for, like they just pick up the phone and it's, it's a hall of famer. And the hall of famer says, Hey, I watched your match on NWA. You guys are doing business the right way. They're not, they're not being complimentary to be complimentary. The old guys and the old gals pop because they go, that's how you draw money. Now, it's easy to sit there and say, well, Vince McMahon, he's a billionaire. He can do whatever he wants. Vince built that thing. Okay. It's easy to point fingers at Tony and say, well, Tony, his dad, God bless him, made all this money just down the road here in Illinois. And God bless that family. They own all these big franchises and Tony gets to go crazy and, and, and run the ultimate you know, uh, fan driven, uh, league in AEW, but Tony's worked really hard to put that thing and create that. And and I know a lot of the people who end up working for Tony behind the scenes, it's not easy to run a professional wrestling company. So set that aside, because I I'm saying that respectfully, the only way the NWA can succeed truly, unless some billionaire decides he's, he's my biggest fan and wants to get involved. The only way this company succeeds is we have to figure out how to draw money the old fashioned way. That's it. There's no, there's no other version of it. I don't have that much money. I don't have that much fame. I can't leverage all that. So we are going to have to learn how to draw money the old fashioned way. Now, some people in the business say, ain't going to work. Times have changed. That old way of doing business is antiquated. What people want to see is five false finishes and a guy jumping off a roof. People will tell me that, and and they might be right. I cannot sit here and tell you that they are wrong and I am right. But when well, I, I when I talk to Ricky Morton and, and this litany of, of people who've drawn a lot of money in the business, somewhere between what I believe and what I feel intuitively and what they tell me, 
you see that in the NWA. You know, we've all sitting here are not, you know, we're, we're not boring into the wrestling business. We've had conversations with guys who shaped our opinions and shaped our th thought process and our creative processes on how we would like to do business if we were ever in your position. Who were those guys that you broke bread over or had drinks with or creative friendships with who created your sensibility and your outlook on how you feel like the creative process of a show should go? Hmm. That's a great question. Honestly, I just watched. Um, I mean, I, I, I can sit here and tell you I can call up Dr. Tom Pritchard and ask him Austin Idol because I trust them and they can. But but I didn't I didn't get to know those people. Uh, in, in fact, the way the wrestling business works, even when I came in the wrestling business, people wouldn't tell me stuff or they give they would give me the kind of like rub my tummy answer like it's good enough <laughs> to, it's good to get rid of you, but I'm not going to give you the real answer. So to be fair, I looked at how Vince is booked going back to the 80s. Um, I looked very hard at um, uh, how Paul Heyman booked ECW. Obviously, I was there for, through some of it. And I had some insider knowledge, including talking to the talent at the time, what was happening. So I got a little bit more three-dimensional aspect. Um, and uh, even, even the way uh, Vince Russo and... Uh, Jarrett booked TNA in the early days um, and, and why I got attached to what they were doing and why they lost me. So I don't mean it as a criticism other than like, I saw way too many, uh, what we call in the business, fucked finishes with Jarrett and guitar shots and three referees. And they used to turn me off as a TNA fan and I would swear off the product and never go back. And then I would go back and they would get me totally into a storyline. They do it all over again. And I get mad all over again. So it's more of a constellation of people that I admired in, in terms of their booking. And I just tried to put those pieces together much like I sat and listened to Beatles records and just figured out like whatever riff they were playing. And was able to figure it out my weird wacky way. <laughs> I'm going to follow it up with this question. I don't know if this is a fair question because there's a lot of hindsight put into this question, but when we saw a lot of that forbidden door stuff pop open, it seemed like a lot of companies were very quick to jump on the bandwagon without thinking what the consequences could be to their talent and how, depending on whether you're an impact fan or not, and these are my words, no one else's, some of your talent and your program get hung out to dry in the deal where it's very one-sided, where he brings all his talent to another show. You were very protective with your talent. You were very protective with your television shows. And, you know, I guess maybe we as uh, – armchair bookers were kind of like wow you know is nwa missing something and now history proves you right where the forbidden door was great your talent was protected and you didn't have a bunch of uh, you know aew talent running all over your show without getting television time on his was that something you kind of thought ahead of when when this whole thing started going down yeah well it's to be fair um i can't say my phone was ringing off the hook but there were times where I, I intersected with Tony Khan. There's times I've intersected with Scott Demore and other promotions. Um, and my, my thing from the beginning of only NWA is the doors open. And I think it, you've seen the buzz that's come off the recent regional uh, announcement with EC3 running Exodus pro. We have promotions from all over the world, uh, Chile, Australia, UK, people all over Japan, all of a sudden now want to be back in the NWA territory system, which is awesome. And I hope over the next year we can sort of expand that out uh, right, rightfully so, because I think the business will uh, benefit from it, as will hopefully the NWA. Um, yeah, it's tough because um, how can I put it? If if. I'm going to say I'm going to say this in code. And if people are smart enough and I'll assume your audience is to hear what I'm saying. And if and if they're not, I'm apologize, but I'm not going to tell you the truth because you don't I, I'm not saying you don't deserve it. But it's like it's going to put me in a weird position if I say what really happened. So I'm going to tell you a story that's totally made up. <laughs> OK, I'm a, rock yes. star, I'm a rock star that's well established. Right. So so let's just, you know, if you don't like my music, that's OK. But everybody knows I'm a rock star. Right. OK. If some guy in a young band calls me up and says, hey, I'm your biggest fan. My band just got a record deal. I would love to write a song with you. Da, 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 da. And I go, cool. Uh, give me 90% of your song and I'll write a song with you. Even if you write it and I, 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 I do one lazy guitar riff, 
you're going to give me 90% of your song. By the way, that does happen in pop music all the time. I went out with a pop singer and they would do that stuff before they even walked through the door. They would take most of the song. What I'm saying is, if I use my position as a rock star to leverage a young person in the business or somebody who doesn't have power, okay, yeah, I can I do it? But it's not, not the way I want to roll. I've been in some of these positions with people at other companies where they were way, way, way over leveraging. And I, and I, I literally in the conversations, and I'm being honest here, I would just raise my hand and say, I don't need you. Uh, I want to do business with you. If you want to lean on me too hard, I'm just going to def def deflect to I'm Billy Corgan and I don't need you. And, and I can, and I can tell you one thing, which is a bit inside baseball, but for a while I was negotiating with WWE and they were great. I got nothing negative to say about WWE ever. We were talking about being on their network for a while. It didn't work out. But in one of my conversations with WWE executives, I said something in the negotiations and they started laughing on the call. It was a weird laugh. Like I, I thought I'd sort of stepped on a landmine, you know, like I did something wrong. And they said, no, 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 you didn't do, you didn't do anything wrong. And I go, well, then why are you laughing? And they said, because you're the only person we've ever dealt with in professional wrestling that isn't willing to sell themselves out for a dollar. You're so unusual because of your position in the world and the fact that you have your own resources. You don't, you, most people we talk to pretend to have power, but they don't really have power. You have power and you don't abuse it. And we actually like dealing with you. And we actually do want to do a deal with you because we feel you understand. Because we're WWE and we could squash anybody like a bug, but that's not how we want to do business. We want to do business with people who want to do business with us, but also understand we're WWE. So the fact that you're not fronting to us is a good thing, right? This is years ago. This is nothing recent, right? So that's what I'm saying. In some of these interactions, I felt like people were trying to kind of bum rush, bum rush me around. And I was like, I, I, I'm just going to worry about the NWA. So when those opportunities kind of went by, and I'm way, way over explaining, sorry. But when those opportunities didn't really kind of line up the way I would have liked, um, then I just, I, just, I just told everybody in the NWA, we're going to just focus on the NWA. And what's weird is, since we've done that over the last year and a half or so, the NWA has gotten a lot stronger. We're not looking for somebody to come from up top and save us or we'll throw a wrestler on our pay-per-view to make you know, everything happen. And now people are calling us. So maybe that was a good decision. I would love to work with anybody in the business, and that includes the McMahons. I, I would love it. I think, I think wrestling – look, there's stuff of Harley Race and I think Bruno San Martino. I mean, you know, Bob Backlund, I think, it was Harley Race. They did like WWF versus NWA. I, I love that stuff. As a fan, I mean – the wrestling companies really should work together more. I would, I would love that. But when I say that, it just sounds self-serving because they're like, it sounds like I'm raising my hand, like, hey, pick me. I'm totally well, it, it doesn't happen. But I think it's, it, was, it sounds like you're coming from a place of a fan, though. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, but no, it sounds fine. like please cut me off. But but that's what it sounds like to me is that you're coming from a place of a fan and seeing the things that you want to see. And and I do agree with you. I think wrestling companies should work with each other more often. The one, one of the things that's happened recently that you announced is, is this whole new territory thing, right? And I know that there's a lot of indies out there. I'm just trying to figure out how, how, it's, how you would make it work, right? I think it's a genius idea, but we're talking about promoters who are just somewhat fans. You know, I promoted a show 15 years ago, a few shows, you know, uh, performed on it, whatever it was, booked it produce some of the matches as a fan you know all the boys got paid and whatever and i know how hard that was but we're talking about now you know some of these regional promotions are more fan owned or operated how do you consolidate uh, consolidate that because i don't you know and not burn it out how do you who does it answer to um is there a board of directors is there you know, or does it become like the territories when Crockett became the biggest out of all of them? He became the boss and made all called all this. Like, how does it stay even and fair if you're inviting other territories into the NWA? Is there a kingpin? Is there, you know, how does that work? Yeah, I, it's a fantastic question. I appreciate you asking. The simple version is um, you want to like with the EC3 uh, thing, that's a good way to start. So we're starting with just one title that's going to be recognized by the NWA, which will be his heavyweight championship. So it'll be the NWA Exodus Pro uh, Midwestern Championship. So he's he'll have the he'll have the Midwest Regional Champion. You know, have a kind of an identified territory, which is his. Even if right now he's only running Cleveland, 
Okay. So he and I booked the, that champion together in exchange for creating a framework business. Now he has access to every NWA champion and anybody, and anybody on the NWA roster. He also gets the promotional thing of me promoting not only Exodus Pro, but Exodus Pro can be part of uh, programming. We were talking today about putting an Exodus Pro match probably on the pre-show of the pay-per-view on, on October 28th. So now he can turn to wrestlers working for his company, including young wrestlers who want to make their way up the thing and say, look, my access to the NWA is now going to get you on a pay-per-view. I, I'm, I'm bringing you through the door, not Billy Corgan. Billy Corgan's opening the door and now I walk you through. So that gives him leverage in what he's trying to do. And in exchange for that, we can hopefully start signing some young talent, putting them under deals. And if they're not ready for regular television, I can send them to EC3. And when I was there the other day with EC3, we had a seminar. Here's who's in the seminar. Aaron Stevens, Tom Latimer, EC3, and Jeremiah Plunkett, who's a very, very good uh, professional wrestler, you know, out of sort of the uh, Omaha, Oklahoma type area. Um, I just know he's west of Nashville. Sorry, Plunky. Um, but the point is, is like, if you're a young wrestler coming into Exodus Pro, you're doing a seminar in front of four people who have say in professional wrestling, who worked on television, who worked for Vince McMahon, who've been in territorial systems. I mean, that's huge, huge. So it's like part barter, part trust, and part business framework. And so we hope to expand that. To your question of who to work with on the indies, I think it'll be if people have a proven track record and a proven thing of success and they can show they consistently draw in a territory, then it's worth talking about because then you're trying to figure out how to put their, their business combined with your business where one plus one equals three. I think ultimately it's going to be more about what each uh, promotion gets in exchange of energy and marketability and less really about the financial side, because realistically, what can I ask an indie to be in the NWA? I mean, I could hold them up for some money, but that's not going to change the NWA's fortune. And now I got maybe a situation where, you know, they're mad because they paid money and I didn't do the thing they wanted. I think it's ultimately a relationship based thing. So um, we'll, we'll slow walk it to the extent that we're not going to just throw the doors open and anybody can be in the NWA. I think it'll be a very, very exclusive club. And if you're in it, it will mean something. Mm. You know, I, I want to go back to talking about the NWA and where you guys have had you know, shows in the past and coming up, you know, Cleveland, Nashville, you've done a ton of shows in St. Louis, which I've missed a couple of them. I'm originally from St. Louis. I'm in Michigan now. How do you look going forward now to towns that maybe you have or haven't run? Uh, what towns are starting to get looked at that may not have been on the list? Is there any kind of uh, insight you can give us to how maybe you guys start booking your towns going forward? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, up to this point, hopefully it's going to change in 2024. It's very hard to go into a new territory. Mm. Um, you feel like you're literally starting a company from scratch. Um so, you know, traditional NWA hotbeds, Dallas, Houston, uh, we ran one time in New Orleans. I, li I liked it, but the, some people in the office didn't, weren't as happy with it as, 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 as I was from the outside. Uh, Florida obviously had a strong uh, NWA presence, Carolinas, uh, up into Ohio and stuff like that. And we haven't run New York or Philly yet. Um, hopefully we're going to run Philly for the first time in, uh, in 2024. So you kind of look at that as a place to start. But it's very, very difficult. The easiest thing is you try to find a plug and play situation with a local promoter where they have an infrastructure that you can com kind of combine with. And again, one plus one equals three. Um, you know, when I bought the NWA, I thought that stuff would have been easier. It turned out to be a lot more difficult, similar to the Forbidden Door stuff, where it's like you get into kind of fiefdoms and this is our world and we got to do it this way. And you're like, OK, well, we'll just move on to something else. And then you look four years later and those promotions are exactly where they were four years before. Mm where an association with the uh, NWA might have been a good thing for them. Can't say it would have been, but that's where it's like, uh, what's the old saying, B big fish and small pond stuff. I want to, I want to find uh, local promoters who don't want to just be big fish in small ponds. They want to be big fish in bigger ponds. Um, and, and, and unfortunately with wrestling indie promoters that, you know, they're not as many of those people as you would like. And I, I understand why it's very hard to run an indie promotion in a, local territory. I've, I've, I've had my time with it. Um, and I understand why people get possessive, but again, sometimes it's hard for people to see the bigger picture on the outside. I think slowly the NWA is making the case and certainly Tony Khan's success of bringing independent wrestling style to the national stage certainly helped help that pipeline. Uh, and, and I think 
it's hard to kind of calculate the long term of success as AEW as a promotion because that story is still being written. But I will tell you this much meeting a young Billy Starks, right, already signed to AEW at 18. I think you're going to see a generation of young wrestlers coming that are going to be far more abundant, far more females entering the professional wrestling ranks than ever before. So the bounty of AEW past the success of AEW will be, it will affect the entire professional wrestling business because much like a rock revolution, there's a bunch of kids right now figuring it out in backyards and local indie promotions. They're going to be the, the big stars of tomorrow. So I think it's going to ultimately be very beneficial, particularly with youth. Well, mentioning that, don't you think it's a disservice, though, to the professional wrestling business when you get these 18-year-old kids who are having their first matches live on TV? And, you know, I think that you, you the, a lot of the TV that's out there right now, um, you know, I dare to say subpar. You know, I don't know how that attracts new a new fan base if they don't, if there's communication breakdowns or they're greener than green. You know, it's like, you know, I do you ever I mean don't you see that yourself with that I see it slightly differently um I think those criticisms are fair but I think uh one thing I have seen and we we have definitely gotten younger over the past year and we are seeing the effect of that in terms of the rise of social media and who's watching NWA power uh much like we once were uh when young people see young faces on television the identity is far stronger than let's call it the quality of whatever's happening. I, I, I mean, I, I just think there's something that's very powerful when you're 17 and you might want to be a professional wrestler and you see somebody in a professional wrestling ring who's not that much older than you, looks like you, talks like you, walks like you, looks at their phone like you do. There's something about that identity process that's very powerful, particularly, but particularly for young females. I think seeing strong Females on television of every of every background is going to be very, very beneficial to the professional wrestling business going forward, because the hardest thing to do is find talented young women who can wrestle at a high level, who, by the way, haven't been taken advantage of in ways that young women can be taken advantage of any form of entertainment by people who aren't not trustworthy. It's hard for pe young women particularly to break in any entertainment business. Wrestling is no different than that. So if they feel they can trust the situation that they're in and, and uh, come into a locker room that's welcoming and supportive. I think those things are critical. And I think I, we're seeing the real effects of that now. Well, do, I, but I mean, I'm start. I'm not, I'm not trying to bust your balls, Billy, but I uh, d don't, you think it's sort of, you know, negates itself. What, what we're talking about here is like throwing people who are maybe not ready for the opportunity and giving them the opportunity to do something and, not delivering doesn't that do more damage to the professional wrestling business or to them themselves if if you're throwing somebody into the into the wolves and you know it's, it's kind of a sink or swim situation yeah well that's difficult because i think that's an eye of the beholder situation um uh i was i was criticized heavily for uh when i was asked why we were not running another all-female pay-per-view uh, basically following up on NWA Empower, which we ran at NWA 73 on night one of the two night event. I, I said, because I like to be transparent, I said, there are enough, there are not enough TV ready, NWA ready talents to be put on a live pay per view and marketed as a, as a sort of future leaning, this is a progressive act on every level, including wrestling. There are not enough people ready because a lot of the comma, a lot of the top talent has been signed. There are not as many free agents to go out into the market. We try to cut deals with other companies. We basically got the door closed in our face. OK, I didn't go out and whine about that at the time, but that was part of the thing. We went to other companies and said, hey, hey we'd like to have access to some of your top female talent to build the show. The answer was kind of a we'll get back to you. And then, of course, they never got back to us. So now I look into the independent mar market and there just weren't enough TV ready. And I even said, do you understand that if you put young talent on television who are not TV ready, that buries those talent? That's irresponsible to me. So, yeah, I can get my headline. NWA runs another NWA in power. But at the end of the day, I'm doing it knowing I'm not putting on a top quality product. And I had... Maria Canellis, who I've worked with for years, 
who I've done behind the scenes uh, things for. No, no complaint. I love Marie as a person. Uh, you know, I've had her husband work in, in the NWA, now working for Tony with the Ring of Honor, uh, Mike Bennett. Got no problem with Mike Bennett not going up front. And there's Maria Canellis, you know, criticizing me, saying, you know, we have a ton of top talent. We have, she has her all female uh, company, you know. I'm sorry. I, I'm looking, I'm looking at some of the independent talent that were available. And I just didn't see a pay per view level roster that I could put together. So if I was a scumbag to get people off my back, I would just throw an all female event out to take the little check mark but because i value the nwa brand i want to be able to look people in the eyes such as yourselves and say and i and i say this straight i think right now the nwa women's roster is the strongest female roster in all of professional wrestling they are killing it routinely the female matches on our pay-per-views are the strongest matches of the night and by the way that's supported by the male side of the locker room they will stand up and applaud it just like I do because they understand the women are killing it. And that's not a, you know, you get, you, you do a bell grade. Well, they're women. So they get a different mark. No, no, they are killing it. They are setting the standard for the NWA right now. So I want to be part of that. I want to be part of the qualitative argument that women can draw can main event pay-per-views and night one of NWA uh, 75, Camille and Markova, Best match of the NWA's uh, 2023. They absolutely killed it. They did like 15 minutes, beat the holy fuck out of each other, and delivered a. F- I don't want to say the jerk off match thing again. I'll get more headlines. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I know we're getting down to our last few questions of the night, and we don't want to keep you too much. But before we ask them, don't forget pay per view October 28th, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, November 4th, Nashville Skyway. Great, by the way. Love going to Nashville. The Skyway Studios, phenomenal. When I was there for Impact, November 18th. Is that a television taping? And where is that at? It's a live show in Sarasota, actually in an old NWA building that hasn't been run for I think over 20 oh. years, called Robards in Sarasota. Wow. It's an old building that Dusty and all of them used to run all the time on the Florida circuit with the with the Grams. Um, and so we're running that building and uh, and so far it's selling really well. So we're very excited. The show. So that'd be like a live TV taping. We call it a road trip show. And we just break that into TV, kind of like ECW used to do. You tape a live show and then just break it into different episodes. So very excited about that. So that right now, that's our that's our calendar for the rest of the year. And now this isn't my last question tonight, but for people that may watch this a little bit later down the line, where can people go when you start to transition from YouTube and internet to television to get that news and figure out when the times and tapings will be? Um, always NWA socials, Instagram and Twitter. We're very active on those. So if you just follow us on there, um, I would love to tell you to subscribe to YouTube and please watch power as long as it's still on there. The problem with YouTube is even if you're a subscriber, you'd always don't get the prompts. You don't, you don't get reminded and mm. you can't even put ads on YouTube. Every time we try to put an ad, like literally I could just cut an ad. Hey, it's Billy Corgan, the national wrestling Alliance. Please watch saw win from Cleveland, Ohio, you know, October 28th. It, we get a thing back offensive ad will not post. You, you, you try to con- email contact something. No, no answer. Mm. All right. Well, listen, for my last question of the night, uh, we've touched upon a lot of the creative aspects in your fandom. How does owning the NWA, being behind creative, doing all this stuff affect how you watch wrestling now? Can you even still be a fan in your position? Very much so, because I think um, the bad side of being a musician is bad music makes me insane and great music <laughs> inspires me. Does that sound familiar, Lars? Oh my God, yeah. Right? The good part about being a professional wrestling is when I see a great match, when I see two people who are really good at their job mm-hmm. and kill it, I'm like, wow. Because I realize how hard it really is now. I really do. I'm not hyping. I'm saying... When you see two people are really good at what they do or four or six or whatever, and they tear the house down, you realize the sweat equity, the journey that they're on and why they're so kind of wound up in their brains. Because to get there and to make it happen takes a certain kind of insanity. But when you see bad wrestling and you know that you've talked to that talent 14 times and said, please, just just sell, you know, 
work the leg. Yeah. But you know, sell. And it's like, it's like talking to a brick wall. Mm -hmm. And, and at the end of the day, they don't believe enough in themselves or the product or the combination thereof to understand that that's where the money is in professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, it's the movie equivalent of like, you know, Spider-Man's trying to hang on and he's out of the web and he's going to die. And then he turns to the camera and goes, yeah, I'm just not feeling it right now. Give me a second. <laughs> I, I, I got to get to, I got to get to TGIF Fridays cause I got a hot rat waiting for me. And, uh, uh okay, now I'll go back to selling the leg. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, God bless on that. It's, uh, let me just say this because I, you know, I am a, I am a different person in wrestling for, for, for all the obvious reasons start here. I, I love the business. It makes me insane. I'm so proud that we've been able collectively to bring back the NWA where we can even have a conversation. When I talk about the NWA going on a bigger and better, better things, people don't think I'm completely nuts for saying it. Like, I, it's not like, yeah, I don't really believe that, but he can say that people really do legitimately believe now, not all of them, but enough and certainly people in high positions in professional wrestling realize that I'm serious. So that journey and, and you supporting that journey means a lot to me because um, I think anybody who's a wrestling fan and I, and I'm going to make my bad rock and roll argument. There's nothing wrong with more great bands. There's nothing wrong with more great wrestling companies. If you love professional wrestling, why wouldn't you want more great professional wrestling? Why wouldn't you want more great matchups? Why would you great, want great new stars to, to follow along. With. Um, and that's why I get into that thing of like, if you don't like the way we're doing it, you really don't like professional wrestling. You just like this type of professional wrestling. And that's fine. I mean, I don't like every genre of music. It's, it's I consider myself a music fan because I like enough. But when you got people who only like one style of professional wrestling or one company, I'm sorry, that doesn't strike me as a fan. That strikes me as a fan of that. And that's different to me. Um, maybe I'm biased because I, I grew up in a different era of professional wrestling. I'm a little bit older than most of the fans. And, uh, and, and running a professional wrestling company, you do get a different insight into how professional wrestling works. And as, as I got into a, a spat yesterday with a noted wrestling uh, historian slash uh, whatever he's called, you know, at the end of the day, everybody can have an opinion but until you work in professional wrestling and you're really in there during those long hours and watching the kids set up the rings and you're paying for things and you're dealing with the popcorn guy, you don't really understand the magic of professional wrestling and the slog that is professional wrestling. So anybody who's really passionate about the business and wants the business to survive and grow and wants to see everybody succeed in the business, I don't think you can really appreciate everything I'm trying to say because the worst thing you can call me in professional wrestling is a fan. I like to laugh because it's like I'm paying a lot to be a fan. It would be cheaper, <laughs> it would be cheaper just to go to the shows. Yeah. I really want professional wrestling to come out of the old dark ages. I want professional wrestling to be as credible as a, a brand of entertainment as MMA and NHL and NBA. These are great athletes. They're very talented people. And when it's done right and, you know, we're all fans here, it's awesome. And when it gets dumb and pernicious and clickbaity and my team's better than your team. And I'm sorry, that's, that's ultimately a, a form of childishness. I can't follow. Them. It really does a disservice to the Ricky Morton's who put 40 plus years into the, into the ring, whose father was a referee. Okay. Let me tell you, because I appreciate you uh, in tolerating my long answers. We love this stuff. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm friendly or friends with Ricky Morton. I think he would consider me a friend. Ricky Morton and I will DM on Instagram, right? Ricky Morton will send me, you know, wake up and there's a thing from Ricky, okay? And he'll send me a clip of his father refereeing a match from 30 years ago. Okay, so stop. Ricky Morton, arguably one of the greatest tag teams, if not the greatest tag team of all time, right? WWE Hall of Famer, okay? He's been in the business... 45 years, 47 years, Austin Idol business, 50 years. Okay. They lead, sweat, sleep, professional wrestling. If they can be passionate about it to that level where they're still popping for, Hey, check out this photo of my dad in a wrestling ring 
30 years ago, referee in this match. That's what I'm saying. The, that's the passion that I think most fans have. This other thing is about a bunch of other stuff. It's like people arguing about Star Wars toys or something. It's like, it's cool. Yeah. But most Star Wars fans just want to watch a good movie and, and talk about like what should have happened or didn't happen. When it gets into all that other stuff, that's where you lose me. So that's what I'm saying. I orient my North Stars around the Ricky Mortons and the Austin Idols who put 50 years in. Let me tell you one last quick story. Uh, and I don't think he mind me tell, talking it. Well, actually, I think he told it because we did a little interview thing on, on, on for NWA. So he's in a car. He's been a ref. He was trained by Bob Roop and, and uh, Jack Briscoe, NWA uh, World Heavyweight Champion at the time. Uh, Eddie Graham and Mike Graham, who was Eddie Graham's son. He's trained for over a year. He hasn't wrestled at all. And now he's a referee. This is total kayfabe time. I asked him, I said, when's the first time that they broke kayfabe? He said it was after a year. He was in a car with Jack Briscoe, who was the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, and Jack's driving the car. And they're going to a show, and they're driving three hours in the car. And Jack turns to him and says to Idol, now be a man, he's been around the business for a year, and no one's broken kayfabe. And Jack Briscoe turns to him and goes, you know, you know, we have to, you know, we have to feed our families, and we're not going to go out and kill each other tonight. We're going to put on a good show. OK, so if that guy came up in that business and he still believes in the NWA 50 years later and he still loves professional wrestling and he still comes to me and says, why doesn't that kid want to do the right finish? Does he understand that the money is not in popping the marks? The money is in doing business that will get people to come back in and buy another ticket. Until you really hear that, like three dimensionally from legend after legend after legend. You don't really understand. And I'm not saying that in some way, like I know something that you don't know. I'm saying is I've had to learn that. I was the fan sitting there going, ah, oh, Vince McMahon should have changed this finish. And why don't they, you know, put more buzz on Santino or what? You know what I mean? I was that guy. I was the guy reading the dirt sheets and thinking I knew the ne more than everybody else. It's not really what the business is about. The business is about passion. It's about passion. And when you pervert passion in, in wrestling or rock and roll and, and Lars and I, you know, we've lived it. Trust me. I'm going to ask you a question, Lars. Can they pay you enough? If you don't really give a shit about music, can they pay you enough money to get on stage? No. Right. Right. It's got to come from here. Straight up. There are days when you got to be away from home. If you don't love it, if you don't love who you're on stage with, they cannot pay you enough to get up there. Two divorces later, bro. <laughs> God bless. Well, if you ever need a job, thank you. Come hit me up at the NWA. I got a, I got a spot for you. Lars, dude, you could get, dude, best. you got to well, text him immediately. Well, well, of course I am. Uh, you know, th it, this has been probably one of my favorite interviews I've ever done about professional wrestling. And there's a couple reasons why. And one of the things I wanted to get to, because I really wanted to ask you about Kerry Morton, because I think he's what the future is of professional wrestling. I really look at that kid and I think to myself, he's got a brain. He can work. Yeah, he's a little rough around the edges, but he brings that Southern style to a T. You know, I mean, it, it would it would be hard for him not to. You know what I mean? It's I don't feel like the apple fell too far from the tree. But do you see him as a future NWA champion? Do you see him as, at that caliber? I know you're his boss, right? But, but I mean, do you look at him and kind of go, Jesus Christ, this kid's going to be something one day? I resisted him coming in because a lot of kids who have famous parents, you know, they have a hard time living in the shadow of that parent for a variety of reasons. So I resisted him coming in. He came in. And I saw enough to keep booking him. Over time, I got to know him as a person. Over time, I got to see his strengths and weaknesses and where he kept improving mm. loop after loop after loop. Then Ricky gets in my ear and says, what do you want to do with uh, my kid here? And I said, well, I definitely see something. And he said, my number one thing with my son is his education. I want him to graduate. I never had school. 
Mm -hmm. It's important to me as a father. Now he's, he's not Ricky Morton, the legend. He's Ricky Morton, the father right. talking to another father. Do you understand? My number one thing with Carrie is education. If you're willing to work around his schedule with education, I think this is where Carrie needs to be. I said, deal. Carrie's under a long-term contract with the NWA. And when we started to make our, let's call it our youth movement, the NWA, where we started shifting the priority away from, you know, tenured veterans who deserve respect to taking chances on young talents who we think the NWA future lies with. Um, Carrie was number one on that list. And Pat, Kenny, and I were like, we're going to build this company around, around Carrie Morton. It's been the, one of the best decisions I've made. Carrie is absolutely all in on the NWA. Uh, he's the leader in the locker room. He grew up in the business, so he doesn't take shit from anybody. And I've seen it. He's tough as nails. And he has a really bright future. And he's still in school. Um, and that's part of that equation. Um, and there's other things that Carrie Morton's doing for the NWA that's just sort of between us. But let's just say overall, model citizen, model employee. Uh, and I'm very, very proud to be in business with the Mortons as, as a family. It's really... It's really a pleasure and an honor on, for, for more reasons than I could list in, in, in the time we have. It's just, again, that's the business for me. So if you want to call that throwback, if you want to call that old school, you want to call that some, uh, some stuff that only exists in my mind, I'm cool with that. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Uh, when, when I was playing guitar solos in 89 and a bunch of hipsters had a problem with it, and they were, we were playing too loud, too long, too weird. My voice was too weird. We just ignored it and it worked. So I'm kind of in the same boat with the NWA. I really feel there's enough indications that where we're going. And I'm glad that you picked Carrie out of that lineup because it's hard to, it's hard to put it in this way, but there's just times where you go, I'm doing a lot here. I got, you know, when we wrestle, we have 80, probably 80 people in the building, just rest on the wrestling side. And then over a hundred with personnel, camera people and everything, right? It's a lot of people to fly in to Sarasota or Tampa or whatever we do it. At some point you got to kind of sit there and go that one. And at some point I went Kenzie page, Kenzie page, when she came in the NWA was, was a jobber. She came with you, Dr. Tom Pritchard. She was probably 40, 50 pounds heavier. Kenzie Page is now the NWA World's Women's Champion. I think she's, what, 23? Carrie Morton's 22 years old. I know. So at some point, I sat there and went, him and her. Now, that's a lot to put on young shoulders, but somebody made that decision with me, and it was a good decision. Yeah. Um, so if that's my own projection, it is what it is, but I'm saying at some point you got to kind of make a bet, like who are we and who in this panoply of talents represents what the NWA means. Go watch Ricky Morton when he's scrawny, smaller than Carrie. And it's just basically a jobber on like whatever Memphis TV. See if you can spot Ricky Morton in his first year and go, that guy will become the greatest <laughs> selling baby face in the history of the business. You don't see it, but somebody saw it. Yeah. I think Ricky said, I think Ricky said it was Paul Bosch of oh. Houston. Wow. He was maybe one of the first people to kind of get Ricky's upside as, as a draw. Go watch Macho Man early on. Yeah. Right? He's good. He's got good size. Definitely got a charisma, but he ain't the macho man yet. You know what I mean? There's like even Hogan when he's in Minnesota, like you see it, but it isn't all there yet. Mm -hmm. Vince helped him put those pieces together, obviously, or Japan did. I don't know. But I'm saying is you got to take that flyer. And so we're in that spot now. And just a quick side thing. This is where the territorial thing is going to be super important mm -hmm. because now hopefully instead of just 10 young talents or 20 young talents, I'm going to have a hundred to look at. I saw these, I don't want to say their name, but I got them coming in for TV on November 4th. I saw a, a tag team the other day uh, with uh, EC3's thing. I hadn't even seen them wrestle. I just saw them cut a promo. And I looked at EC3 and I said, what is that? I pulled the kids aside and they said, what do you think of the promo? And I said, I loved it. And they were like, they were shocked. 
They thought I was going to criticize them. So I loved it. I said, I hope you can wrestle. <laughs> right? I said something in my little speech, and I think it's a good way to end. I gave a little speech to the talent in the seminar, and I said, if your job is to go out and job, you, you getting a job with me might be the difference of you, get, you do the greatest job match I've ever seen. So if your job is to go out there and sell, you sell like you're the greatest. You sell like you're Ricky Morton. Right. They went out there and did a match, got completely squashed by a far bigger team. They got their asses kicked for like five minutes. They came back through the curtains and they said, did we do, did we do a good job in the way that you asked? And I said, yep, you just want a job with me. Wow. Barely any offense in the match. Now, is that a five-star match? No. Is that, oh my God, there's the future of the business? No. There's two kids who in one afternoon proved to me that they deserve an opportunity. The rest from there is up to the audience. Right. The biggest mistake any wrestler makes with me is thinking that because I hold the, the book, that just because I write their name in a book, the fans are going to love them. It don't work that way. Right. They, they've tried to get rid of me out of the music business 35 times. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's yeah. about, it's about the audience. I mean, thank God for the audience, you know, who's put up with my shenanigans. Right. So thank you for this opportunity to sort of peer back the curtain a little bit. And I appreciate that you're interested in this stuff. And I'd love to talk to you any other time about any other aspect of it. Fuck yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I think, I think I got a new catchphrase for you. Okay. <laughs> And this is how you can do it. So just bear with me. All right. I'm you gonna... could just like look at motherfuckers when they're, when they're talking shit, you can go, despite all my rage, I own the fucking NWA. Uh, I know that was cheesy, bro, but whatever. Okay. I'm wow. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so thankful it was you this time and not me saying something I, well, dumb. See, I, you know what? I see. I have the ability to embarrass myself too, Dennis. Thank you. But, honestly, Billy, that was fucking incredible. Thank you so much for, you for taking friend. the time. Are Don't we best friends now, Billy? Such are we... a great time. Such a great oh, time. Thank you. Are we all best friends now? I think so. Okay. He just just offered me a job. I got we're something to do my, after we're now my favorite podcasts yeah. hosts. Until the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, listen, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. Wrestling perspective. Thank you guys so much for watching. Click, watch, subscribe, do all that stuff. Support us. We totally appreciate you. Billy Corgan, NWA, make sure you go check them out October 28th, okay? Go get that pay-per-view. It's I'll be watching. I'm going to try to go. I'm going to try to uh, finagle free tickets because I'm cheap. I'm a divorced guy. So uh, I got you hooked up on the free. Just just come. Um, I love you. You are now <laughs> – I love you. All right, so uh, this is the end of the podcast. Go home, everybody. Billy, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. Thank you guys so much.